um, technically this is an exhibition at Parasite in Hong Kong, and the title is A Luxury We Cannot Afford, which is based on, um, based on a series of um, a, a statement that was made by the founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew at the time of 1960 addressing the National University of Singapore. This was also like year marking the first cycle of industrial industrialization in Singapore where like humanities and culture were all sidelined in an effort to bring Singapore from a third world nation to a first world nation itself. Now, um, I'll get into that later on, but like just sort of an idea about like um, how we see Singapore, like from, of course, like from the furthest end of it all, we have The Road to Singapore, which is this like 50s to 70s uh, movie series by Bing Crosby and Bob Hope and Dorothy Lamar that actually traveled all around the world, but they never moved beyond Hollywood. The sets were all in Hollywood. Or more recently in 2014 with the Pirates of Caribbean at World's End, namely Singapore, obviously not taking Australia into the equation for, ge for geography's sake. But one of the other things that I was also looking at as to how Singapore positions itself to the rest of Asia, particularly since Singapore as the head of the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation, in the aftermath itself. So one of the things that I got here is... This is actually a 1991 clip by the Singapore Tourism Board to the Hong Kong audience in a way of kind of, entre uh, kind of uh, um, enticing Hong Kong citizens to migrate to Singapore in fear of 1997 during the handover itself. And the title of the song itself says, Over There Is, um, Over there is Heaven, even though we still have a 50-year IS um, Internal Security Act in, in place still going on. 心中多理想particularly this year itself, addressing the notion of Singapore is particularly charged because this is actually the 50th year of our independence, not including the three years of self-governance under the British colonial powers. Um, it's very hard to talk about the exhibition because right now not, it hasn't happened yet. So um, how do you talk about the research that happens? And to be honest, it also arises out of this need to kind of look at the um, immense amount of money that the Singapore government is pumping into celebrating the nation. Things such as the Singapore 50 Celebratory Project, which every project gets about 30,000 Singapore dollars, roughly about, about 15,000 euros to do of any aspect to celebrate the nation, the community, no matter how, um, how banal the proposal may be. And also like this assumption, like as you can see in the previous advertisement, the espousal of this xenocentric kind of utopia that goes on without this, uh, without looking at the diversity and the questions of representation. For me, like what was the starting point was also a, a poetry book that was um, printed in 2014 called A Luxury We Cannot Afford, um, dealing with Singapore poetry. Of course, that was a rather, you could say it was a rather um, didactic attempt at addressing the shadow of Lee Kuan Yew and his effect on the whole idea of poetry and literature that unfolded over the years. But it also like, got me thinking, like in terms of 50 years, how do we speak 
of luxuries in a non-consumerist manner, because when you think of Singapore, it's purely consumeristic in terms of like shopping, in terms of eating, in terms of lifestyle, and very seldom about like what does it mean to think about the more basic civil and personal rights. Of course, and then following on, something that I did not expect in the midst of preparing for this expectation was the death of the, prime, the founding prime minister himself, Lee Kuan Yew, in March of 2014. What you see here, it, what happened during that event was this whole mass hysteria that happened in the public the first time that people actually were united under this whole rhetoric that he was Singapore and whatever he did was right. Um, to the point of celebrating him with a bun. <laughs> and of course, this is from um, the Wall Street Journal, that the ban was later retracted because of poor taste. <laughs> it didn't taste good. The bun didn't taste good. I didn't eat it, so I, I have no idea what it meant. <laughs> and also, like, a personal story as to, like, looking behind the industrialization and what happened because it was very much a key part of my parents' generation. Over here you see a Rolex 35. This was, this was part of the Rolex factory in Singapore between 1976 and 1981 at the tail end of the Japan, um, of the Japan, of the Japanese um, flying geese economic project in the second phase itself, where European industries Moved to Singapore and other other smaller industries to kind of kind of take, kind of attempt to take over the electronics uh, industry from Japan itself. So in that attempt, there was this whole fight with regards to low labor costs, with regards to like technology in house, which you will see also this similarly echoed later in 2005, 2006 when you talk about the rise of the Five Tigers economy, which um, is. Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and Malaysia. South Korea. South Korea. What? South Korea. South Korea, sorry. Malaysia was Yeah. So this is just a basic write up of the, about the exhibition itself. There is another thing that's not mentioned within this is also the fact that when you think about freedom of speech not being conditioned with exclusion clauses with regards to race, religion, political and social issues is whether it allows the issues to be addressed in a constructive <coughs> manner. So in which that we look back in contemporary art or visual art, there have been a few echoes that recur because it feels like these issues never seem to be resolved. Whether is it firstly found in this painting, what we call the national language class from 1959, where the question of who the, who the teacher is or who the student is, or even in that sense, what is the language that we're teaching in Singapore, where the national language is Malay, the first language is English, and every one of us have a second language that is our mother tongue. It's also like further expelled in like theater plays such as Spell 7 National Language Class in 2008, where the roles of the teacher and the student are revolved in like a multi, in a more diverse manner in terms of language with the Chinese speaking of the, from the Chinese school background, and of course the Malay, taking on the role of the teacher and trying to like, address such issues. I also like to fall back on our neighbors in Malaysia itself, and this is like one of their key prime minister, Mahathir Mohamad, in 1970, talking about the Malay dilemma and talking about racial right, uh, the racial harmony being that it's neither real or deep-rooted, but the absence of strife was not necessary due to the desire or the reasons for strife, but due to the lack of capacity for about to bring about open conflict, which you also talk about public space. These are from the archives of um, Singapore itself at the time of like the racial riots, the roadblocks, and what was done to segment it. And particularly because of the racial riots also came to be um, what we talk about public housing. Because in, in the 60s, in order to just, um, one of the, the biggest, uh, move in social engineering was to move to the housing development board itself, where 80% of the Singaporean population live in, in racially, um, in racially segregated percentages within each apartment block. So that's one point that I'm trying to look at, 
in terms of history, in terms of wood block prints, in terms of in terms of how it construed through the 50 years itself and whether it has been addressed. The other thing that I'm also looking at is also the arbitrariness of the language that the, that the government uses in all of its um, everyday political reasonings, particularly in the reasonings of what we would call censorship. So this is actually from a few days ago, from 30th of May, where the Arts Council actually withdraws a grant from a comic book that was actually looking at the speculative science fiction of what would have happened. And this itself is an installation shot of a work that I previously installed in 2011 called Ghost Stories by John Lowe. He actually extracts like uh, broadsheets from the 1960s in, in Singapore where there was, it was allowed to talk about ghost stories and in a more like um, Malay-centric kind of, kind of um, tribal way, not tribal, uh, cultured way where we talk about Pontianas, where we talk about like different means and go on. In each of these broadsheets, you will see that the rest of the news are just been cut away and the emphasis is only left on the ghost stories, which now, have, which now cannot be circulated in terms, of, in terms of everyday news. We also look at things like To Singapore With Love, which um, I very briefly like, cut down the whole reasoning behind it, which is documentary looking back at the 60s, um, 80s dissidents who tried to who tried to talk about a better Singapore, who, talked to talk, who tried to talk about a future Singapore but was not allowed to. And, the, and of course, like the reasoning behind the censorship itself that it was not granted any form of legality to be circulated in the mass public within Singapore itself. We, in earlier March this year, we hosted a screening of this documentary in Hong Kong as part of this whole um, exhibition project um, a luxury we cannot afford. And strangely enough, 90% of our audience were Singaporeans who were based in Singapore that took up the entire movie theaters itself. And in a way of like, try to like, to see it. Some even, some of them because of the circulation, because the publicity was mostly done by social media, basically came because they were in Hong Kong for a holiday weekend. And actually registered to come and view the documentary. And also as an art ecology, what can we do against such strange subjective modes of censorship itself that in 2014, we actually tried to put together um, proposed amendments to, to um, the modes of censorship itself. But as an exhibition, how does this come around? How do we not just talk, talk about censorship co-regulation as like a simplistic kind of term itself? And this is a struggle that I'm trying to, trying to look at in a more sensitive manner. So I don't really have a conclusion to this because this exhibition has not happened and it's not happening until September itself. But these are some of the artworks that I have been considering, particularly this work called Sea Change in 2011 by the photographer Nguyen. This actually, he actually, doc what was important about 2011 was that this was the moment where social media was allowed to command um, people were allowed to use social media to comment on political commentaries, social issues, and everything. And this was the time of the first general election. In terms of a, in terms of a general election, it was both disappointing and a success at the same time. Because if you were to look at Singapore as a one-party rule, this was the first time, in, first time since their independence that they only won by the lowest majority of 66% even though they still own about 90% of the parliament seats. I mean, for me, it's also how do you talk about the arbitrariness that happens? And one of the things that I'm also kind of looking at how, when you talk about political resistance, when you talk about auditing, how do you talk about place where there's no open space for such strife to occur? Where do you talk about, how do you talk about such things where like the doctrines of like industry or like, ideologies have been um, removed from discussion for quite some time. One of the things that I also bring to mind is like this whole ludicrous video that I will show as an ending of the ministry, uh, the media development authority, the authority that's in charge of censoring all media or even discussing the discussing ratings for every movie and that they did 
featuring their senior management doing a rap and featuring how they see Singapore in terms of media and culture. To be for the world stage, I jam, I rock, and future escape. We classify media to give you a choice. We consult the community to give you a voice, and the industry has a part to play to make our media city bright as day. Market trends, that's why my very best friend. My eyes on KPI every now and then. Keeping program track for your best referral. Signing off, the numbers go. Yes, yes, yo, we don't stop. Get with it and you rock on. Yes, yes, yo. One of our directions, community and international relations. Be aware, appreciate, adopt, advocate. A meaningful work, learning and play. We'll be consolidating data and building a service-oriented architecture to add value to the economy for a bright future. By LCD screen, you will get a crystal clear picture. Keep your channels open, HD, new TV, right here, anywhere through mobility. My jobs to review the MMCC. My very big guess to industry growth. Hold up, please. They call me that man. I know good directors at the back of my hand. Film and TV, so tell me what's next. Singapore content on an international stage. Yes, yes, yo, we don't stop. Yet we can do our own. Yes, yes, yo, we don't stop. Yet we have to go wide our home. Yes, yes, yo, we don't stop. Yet we can do our own. Yes, yes, yo, we don't stop. Yet we have to go wide our home. Communications is key to grow our media city, hand in hand with the press for publicity. Singapore.